height compression, the measured distance between two points depends on the frame of reference of the observer. The proper length, which we designate as L sub P, of an object is the length of the object measured by someone at rest relative to the object. The length of an object measured in a reference frame that is moving with respect to the object is always less than the proper length. Effect is known as length contraction. Here's a simple derivation of this. Consider a spacecraft traveling with a speed v from one star to another. Two observers. One's at rest on Earth with respect to the stars. We measure the distance between the stars to be the proper length, L sub p, because at rest with respect to the stars themselves. And the time to complete the journey is, measured in this rest frame, is equal to a proper length divided by the speed of the astronaut. The observer in the spacecraft measures the time for the passage of two stars from the same position. So the events are going to happen in the same place for the astronaut. Hence, the astronaut has the proper time. Proper, because that's when the two major events are going to take place the takeoff and the approach to the new star. Because of time dilation, <coughs> proper time is equal to the time measured by the Earth person in the rest frame divided by gamma. Gamma is always greater than one. Because the space traveler reaches the second star in the time delta proper, he or she concludes that the distance L between the stars is equal to their velocity times the proper time, which would be equal to the velocity times the time measured in the rest frame divided by gamma. But the proper length measured in the rest frame is equal to the velocity times the time in that frame, V times delta T. So we have that the length in the rest frame or the length in the uh, sorry, moving frame is equal to the length in the rest frame, the proper length, divided by gamma. The space traveler's length is shorter by gamma, and we remember that gamma is greater than 1, always greater than 1. So the moving observer sees a length that is contracted by, by a factor of 1 over gamma. Here's a general statement on this. If an object has a proper length, L sub p, as measured by an observer at rest with respect to an object, its length L, when it moves with speed v in a direction parallel to its length, is measured as shorter according to this equation. L equal proper length divided by gamma. might look something like this. The measured length of the moving observer is L proper length divided by gamma. 1 over gamma is going to be the square root of 1 minus velocity over the speed of light squared. And so if this were the proper length in the rest frame, this would be the contracted length of the moving frame. <coughs> length contraction only takes place along the direction of motion. That's the direction of moving, that's the direction of the track. I look something like this. So you assign free land on Mars, but as it goes faster and faster, the length gets contracted. It's harder for me to assign. I just thought that was kind of cool. Here's an example. A voyage to Sirius. The astronaut takes a trip to Sirius, which is located a distance of eight light years from the Earth. The astronaut measures the time for the one-way journey to be six years. If the spaceship moves at a constant speed of 0.8 c, 0.8 times the speed of light, how can the eight light-year distance be reconciled with the fact that the 
the time for the astronaut was only six years. In other words, an observer on Earth measured light to require eight years to travel from Earth to Sirius. If you're at Earth, eight years to get there, eight years to get back. We, when we see light from Sirius, it's eight years old. The astronaut measured the time interval of only six years. Is the astronaut traveling faster than the speed of light? Well, because the astronaut is measuring the length of space between Earth and Sirius has in motion with respect to him or her. This is categorized as a length contraction problem. In other words, the astronaut is moving at some speed relativistically, but the length that, that they're traveling, is, which is between Earth and Sirius, is also moving at that same speed in the opposite direction with respect to the astronaut. So that length becomes contracted with respect to the astronaut itself. Here's the astronaut's view. Well, no first uh, gamma is equal to 1 over the square root of 1 minus. Sometimes we use beta for v divided by c, and beta is beta constant. v divided by c squared. In this case, we're moving at 0.8 the speed of light. So that would be 1 over the square root of 1 minus 0.8 squared, which is 1 over the square root of 0.36, 1 over 0.6, or 1.67 is our gamma. So the distance of eight light years represents the proper length from Earth to Sirius as measured by the observer on Earth who is at rest with respect to that length. But the astronaut's contracted length is uh, seen in the moving frame is equal to uh, the proper length divided by gamma, eight light years divided by 1.67, which is 4.8 light years. For the astronaut, the distance from Earth to Sirius is only 4.8 light years. And hence, if they're traveling at 0.8 the speed of light, the time it takes them to get there is 4.8 light years divided by 0.8 the speed of light, which will be 4.8 light years divided by 0.8, one light year per year is the speed of light. So an astronaut's point of view, it's perfectly natural to travel an eight light year distance in six years. Here's the Earth observer's view. Proper length is the Earth's observer's length. That's eight light years away. Time to travel this from a rest perspective is that length divided by the speed of the object, 8 light years divided by 0.8 c, which would be 8 light years divided by 0.8, one light year per year, 10 years. From the Earth's pr perspective, it's taking the astronaut 10 years to travel the 8 light year distance. And that would be the same time we would get from time dilation. In other words, uh, since the Earth's time is dilated with respect to the astronaut's time, the Earth's time is 1.67 times 6 years or 10 years. Yes? So, no, no, I don't understand. But, uh, so, no, this because, is not easy stuff. No. because he's getting closer, he's going almost be like, he's getting closer to it, and it's everything expanding with the part. So, as he's getting closer to it, we're getting further away from it. That's why the, there's the difference. Um, we're being like we're being the rest frame. Right. Observing from the Earth. The Earth is nothing's kind of changing away. for us. Nothing's changing for us. But it, it's it's eight light years away. And we we see this. Moving? Is it not expanding? It's away not. It's not changing with us. That rest with respect to us. <laughs> that distance is at rest with respect to us. Okay. We, we measure that. He's getting closer, at the speed, almost at the speed of light. Right. It's speeding up. So. Or for he or she, the astronaut. Right. Um, the length, length itself, because they're moving at constant speed, so they're not accelerating at all. They're moving at constant speed. That 
length becomes contracted because there, the, the distance we're talking about is moving with respect to the astronaut. The astronauts that rest inside the spacecraft, they're looking out the window, and this, this distance between Earth and Sirius is a contracted distance because it's in the moving frame. Anything moving with respect to you would be contracted. Right? If you're at rest on Earth, nothing's moving toward, we're assuming that Sirius is a stationary system. Yeah. It actually is moving, but we're assuming that it's not moving relative distance. So we're assuming it's a stationary star. But realistically, by the time we got there, it would be gone. <laughs> what do you mean? Like, blew up or something? It could be. Yeah. Or it's blown up 75 years ago. That's a possibility. Yeah. You always have that possibility. That's something we're going to worry about. You're an astronomer, you kind of look at the life cycle of the star, and the series is not, won't, won't blow up but in the next five years, um, even though it is one of those stars burning up pretty fast. To sum it up, between the two, the stationary observer and the moving observer, moving observer will always have the proper time with length contractions, while the observation will always have proper wing, but with time dilation. Yeah. But it's possible that they both could be moving. Then, okay. Yeah, so, right. Well, what you said is right for, for a rest like, you know, moving situation. Yeah. But it's possible they both could be moving and they both would observe, as we said, proper time and proper Okay. Length. Okay, so just say that one more time. Okay. When you have one observe, you have two people, one's at rest, one's moving. The one who is moving has proper time, but will have length dilation, while the one who is stationary has proper length, but will have a time dilation. We want to say length dilation, because you can't have a length longer than your length in the rest frame. Then how would we say it? Your length of contraction. Contraction? So. Okay, I see. Right. You know, we, we can get in trouble with all this. The person who has the proper time is the one who has the clock who's taking time where the events take place, where the key events take place. So in our astronaut event, it's the astronaut took off from Earth, and you arrive at Sirius, and those events, the takeoff and the arrival, happen with you. Okay. So you've got the proper time. Yes? What are the practical applications of this? Because I, like, I know that everybody would take care of that. Well, practical applications, I don't know. I mean, what, what do you use this for, for us? I mean, uh, it's, it's the best application is the study of the universe as we know it. Because this, this explains a lot of the mysteries of how the universe works. And it's, it's the best theory out there right now. Yeah, uh, that's what doesn't, that's what the is wrong. Best theory. Yeah, it could be wrong. <laughs> it could be wrong. You know, in which case, you either, you either throw it out or you modify it, right? But right now, uh, it's been tested hundreds of times with very good, you know, uh, logical tests, and it's come through with flying colors every time. So if you come up with a better theory, you better be able to test with those same tests and come up with the same answers. And uh, that's, that's not likely anytime soon. But, yeah, it's a theory. <laughs> uh, what are practical implications? I mean, if, if it were possible to approach the speed of light, you know, we were saying this astronaut made it from here to Sirius, eight light years distance in six years, right? Mm -hmm. If the astronaut were to go faster, then you might make it to Sirius in a matter of hours, or even faster, a matter of seconds. You could travel across the universe in a matter of seconds. Well, you, you can't have, have the best 
You can't go faster than the speed of light, but if you approach the speed of light, time will slow down for you. And you can traverse long distances across maybe even the universe in a matter of a short time. <laughs> Disregard the fact that we can't build anything that can do that right now. I saw that equation the other night. It's just saying your experience when you st okay that's it's it's actually kind of simple you're out if you're stationary you're experiencing one of reality if you're moving close to the speed of light you're in a separate reality and, and each reality is correct yeah in its own frame of reference so, so since this is possibly not true if you're very good <laughs> test, I come up with a different answer than what's in the thing. It could possibly be correct as well. Um, if, if you're if you are correct, <laughs> I will give you an A for the course and I will take your theory and publish it. <laughs> um, no, because uh, this is this is more correct than anything we've got right now. It's unlikely during the, the action of a task that you would think of something better. During the next week. Yeah. Even though I know you're a pretty bright guy. I know. I can't figure out the problem for me, too. Probably one or two. Yeah. I worked on those two problems for like three hours. That's a gal in relativity. Yeah. Really? Yeah, I thought it was easy the whole time. This is, so this is a hard, uh, this is a hard task. This I haven't finished the lecture yet. <laughs> yeah, it might be better after the lecture. Hopefully. Uh, I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> if the Earth observer were to wait for the observed this arrival, so let's say the astronaut has arrived at Sirius, ten, like, ten years to get there, and as soon as the astronaut arrived, they sent a signal back to Earth saying, I'm here. The Earth observer would have to wait an additional eight years for that signal to come back, traveling at the speed of light. So if you were the Earth observer, you wouldn't know the astronaut got there for 18 years, right? Because it would take the astronaut 10 years in your time frame to get there, eight years for the signal to get back. The astronaut actually got there in six years of their time, but you wouldn't know it. For 18 years. And then you had to respond back to them to let them know that you got the message. Yeah, I mean, yeah, if you had any kind of remote control going on, that really wouldn't be that practical. Okay, so we're talking about practicality here. You might need to send more than one person to take some of this other person gets it before. Yeah. People need to read an author called Heinlein. Heinlein? Mm hmm. By Michael Craig? Better than Crichton. I think what you need is to be able to clone yourself <laughs> along the way. So in case, you know, in case you're not feeling well, then you just clone another person. You don't have time to think about it. Yeah. If the astronaut returns, he or she would arrive after 20 Earth years, but age only 12 years. So the astronaut turns around, comes back, takes another 10 years to get back. What's interesting is, for the Earth observer, you would receive the signal after 18 years that they just arrived, and two years later they would come back. So if they started sending you signals along the way on the way back, you would receive all these signals on the way back in the span of two years. As they're, I'm getting closer, I'm getting closer, I'm coming back. And uh, they'd all be right after each other, and it would almost seem like they're traveling fast. So, electromagnetic uh, waves travel at the speed of light, which is what you would actually send your signal on. Right? That's right. Yeah. So, that's that's why if we communicate at Mars, it takes, uh, what does it take, 45 minutes? I forget how long it takes to see Less than that, isn't it? The moon's a half a second. The moon's a second and a half. Second and a half, excuse me. I was thinking more like 45 seconds or four or five minutes. Oh, Really? Yeah, that'd be slow, quicker than that. 
Okay, look, let's look at it this way. Yeah. Earth to Sun is 1.0 AU, Earth to Mars is 1.4. Yeah, Earth to Sun is 8 minutes. Earth to Mars would be 12 minutes. 12, let's see, 12 could be 4 minutes. Because mm -hmm. we're only half of if we were at closest approach. Mm -hmm. It would be 4 minutes. Um, so the Sun blew up, we have like 8 minutes. That's right. The Sun blew up, we have 8 minutes. Yes, it's enough to travel as fast as we like. Yes. So if the astronaut was in the spaceship for 60 years, like, like I said, he's like 20 when he takes off. If he's in that spaceship for six years, knows he's big alive, will he die in six years of his time or six years of the Earth time? Or would he have to come back to Earth? Like, how would that work? Wait, if the astronaut were to die of unnatural causes, you mean? Well, like, let's just say he's going to die at, like, age eight. Oh, and okay. If he's, if he's 20 years old when he takes off, so he's going to die six years after he takes off. Right. And if he's in that spaceship for six, like, a according to his time, like, he's measured his time in the spaceship in 60 years. Would he die in the spaceship in 60 years, or yes. would he die in 60 years of Earth time? He would die in the spaceship after 60, 60 years, years in his favorite Earth time. time. Okay. But to us, it would be? It would be hundreds of years. Hundreds of years. See, your internal clock never changes. If you've got your three score in 10 years, and you're going to get it no matter yeah. what frame of reference you're moving. Right. So, he could call it, he's not, so he could call it, it's just good in 60 years. The same. Like Bill Collins just says, you know, you don't learn more or anything because you're moving fast. Yeah. So, like, we could be moving at the speed of light right now, and we're, we're there's some other people who are at rest and they're aging a lot faster than we are. You know, what a great thought. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, life goes on as, as normal for us. Though, you know, there's a lot of more time is going on elsewhere. They might be devising better ways to go faster and more at speed of light so they could send money to catch up with us along the way. And if you were like having a heart attack or something and you were going to speed of light, they could go a lot faster and catch you and get back to you before you had it. Or you have more time to stay for the Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm afraid to tell you. <laughs> Surprise early arrival in Sirius. And I was thinking this would be like a John McEnroe character. You know, he's like, You can't be serious. <laughs> I sure am serious, that's my name, buddy, and I'm wearing out. <laughs> Just a play on words. <laughs> Too much tennis. <laughs> Okay, so so one of the keys to a lot of these problems, at least a lot of the early problems, is trying to identify proper time and proper length. A proper length is measured by an observer for whom the endpoints of the length remain fixed in space. That's one way to put it. The endpoints of the length remain fixed in space. The measured length of a body is greater in its rest frame than in any other rest frame. If you were an astronaut and you're traveling along, and you're the moving, <coughs> you're in the moving frame, but you have some kind of box like this in your moving frame, the box in your frame is the same length all the time. It's, that's its proper length because you're in the rest frame. The box is in your restroom. If you look out the window at anything that's traveling out the window, then that's going to be contracted. The proper time interval is measured by an observer for whom the key events take place at the same position in space. <coughs> time difference between the events represented by two readings of a given clock is less in the rest frame of the clock than in any other frame. <coughs> so if you're in the rest frame of the clock, then you would expect that in the non-rest frame, it would be a longer time. Moving clockwise.
run slow, which means that it's less time. Here's a useful formula, which I don't think is in your notes. I think it's something I added because uh, I've been modifying these notes. I have no idea. So you might, you might want to write down the final result of this. But uh, if we start with gamma and we, we want to solve for the velocity in terms of gamma, uh, if we square both sides, gamma squared equals this, solve for velocity with a little bit of algebra. I want to write all this down. So good. Sides, and you get this. The velocity is equal to the square root of 1 minus gamma to the negative 2 times c. Now what I was thinking was that there's a number of problems where they give you gamma. And it's just kind of nice in some of those problems to know what velocity was. So you could, you could just plug it right into this. For example, if gamma were 1.67, you plug that right in, 1 minus 1.67 to the negative 2, you get the square root, and you get 0.82. So your velocity is 0.82. Okay. Neon decay revisited. We're talking about examples that support general rel our uh, special relativity. One example was the muon decay. We have muon particles that are bombarding the Earth. And from a laboratory standpoint, the, uh, the uh, muon lifetime is on the order of microseconds. So um, we were able to explain that, the, that a number of muons actually make it to the Earth where we normally wouldn't expect them to because of time dilation. In our frame of reference, time is expanded for the decay of the muons. They actually, their half-lives actually last longer in our rest frame than in their um, moving frame. So, that, so they make it to the Earth in our rest frame. But what about in the moving frame of the muon? The muon has a definite half-life in that frame of, what, 2.2 microseconds. And what happens to the muon, 75% of the muon survived the journey to the ground. How is this paradox resolved? For the muons, the answer is that the distance between the sky and the ground is contracted. So they're going 
go that distance between the sky and the ground, they still have their same half life in the respirator, but they don't have to go as far. So they actually make it to the ground and contract the plane with the usual experimental half life for the VR. So it works either way. Suppose we have two meter sticks in a relative motion along the direction of their lane. Both of them are, let's say relative motion, let's say both of them are moving pretty fast. If I'm riding in the rest frame of one of them, and I measure the length of the other to be less than one meter because it's contracted and it's moving with respect to me, how can I avoid the conclusion that my meter stick appears more than one meter long to an observer in the rest frame of the other stick. In other words, I look out, I see contracted length, less than one meter long. I would assume maybe that the other observer would see that my meter stick was one meter long, or, or even long. That is longer than, than their spaceship. What is the resolution of this apparent situation? This is what you were talking about a moment ago. They're both moving. And both frames of reference are valid. Each inertial frame must speak for itself. Observations made in one frame provide a description of events only in that frame. Observer A sees B's meter stick as contracted. Observer B sees A's meter stick as contracted. Both are correct. So, two astronauts pass each other at both distance speeds. See one, one spaceship contract as I see it, they look at, at my spaceship, contract as they see it. Both are, rel are valid, and uh, over time that you have a, you have to really reconcile it all, is that somehow you're going to slow down and, and meet at some point to discuss it all. What can two observers agree on? The relative speed of motion with respect to each other, speed b. The speed of light, of any rate of light, because that's a universal constant. So that's, what, that's one of the <coughs> postulates of this whole theory, is that the speed of light is constant for every reference frame. Any reference frame, the speed of light is the same. simultaneity of two events which take place at the same position and time in one particular frame. I'll give you another handout, which I, this, this, uh, the pole in the barn paradox is, is, um, pretty famous example, and everybody's got a different version of it, and uh, I'm not really sure which version I like the best, but some of them are pretty funny. But here's, here's a basic uh, description of this, of this idea. And I put the paradox in quotes because it's not necessarily what you might call a paradox. Because what, what is a paradox? In, by definition. Something, yeah, basically something you can't reconcile at all because there are two views of something and you can't really decide which view is correct. And, um, and it can't be described correctly by any one theory. This, this is not a paradox though, because theoretically it can be described. Right, here, here's how it goes. A pole vaulter moving at 0.75 C carries a horizontal pole 15 meters long toward a 
bar that is 10 meters long. <coughs> Initially, the barn's front door, front and rear doors are open. An observer on the ground can simultaneously close and open the doors by remote control. So they're going to hit a button, and the doors will close simultaneously. When the runner and the pole are inside the barn, the ground observer closes and then opens both doors so that the runner and the pole are momentarily captured inside. And then proceed to exit the barn from the back door. If both the runner and the ground observer agree that the runner makes it safely through the barn. <coughs> All right, so, so there's the situation. Uh, I read a one internet account of this. It's actually put a little bit more interest in me. <coughs> Herbert, as a pole vaulter, uses a pole that's exactly 10 meters long. He can't easily store it in a small apartment. So his friend Arthur, a local farmer, offers to let him keep it in his barn. <coughs> but when Herbert stops by the farm, the two discover that the barn is only 8 meters long, so the pole won't fit. Or will it? Arthur knows some physics, that's the farmer. So he tells Herbert to walk back to the end of the field, hold the pole horizontally over his shoulder, and run as fast as he can towards the barn. <laughs> if he can run through the barn's front door, moving at 80% the speed of light, the pole's length will have contracted from 10 meters to 6 meters, a 40% reduction, and it will fit just inside the barn. Just to prove the point, Arthur and his daughter Gertrude will stand by the front and back barn doors and will slam them shut, them shut just as when Herbert reaches the middle of the barn with one meter of open space in front and behind. And that's the time. time. And then they say, yes, we're using the term friend loosely here because the farmer was supposed to be his friend, but they're going to slam these doors shut <laughs> and see what happens. <coughs> Right, Gertrude, I guess the farmer's daughter. Something else. Yeah. I have a feeling that as he exits through the hole in the side of the barn, he's going to create a vacuum and collapse the rest of the barn on top of him. And there'll be a black hole in the of this one matter. So I think that they've been mistaken. We'll talk about that when we we'll get to general relativity. Here's the ground observer. To the ground observer, the pole is contracted. The value of gamma, in this case, if you're moving at uh, 0.75c, is 1 over 1 minus 0.75 squared, which comes out to 1.51. So the pole, to the ground observer, the, the moving pole is in the direction of the motion, it is equal to the proper length, divided by gamma, 15 meters divided by 1.51 means the pole is 9.9 .9 meters long. And if the barn is only 10 meters long, the pole should be able to fit within the barn. So according to the ground observer, he or she has no problem with momentarily capturing the pole inside the barn. So push the button to close the door. <coughs> Simultaneously close the doors. I had to put something in there. <laughs> so the L pole is the length of the pole with respect to the observer that, um, which is the farmer. But the length proper is the length of the pole with respect to the guy who's carrying it. Right? That's correct. The proper length is the proper length in the restaurant. And he's the one he's at rest with the pole. That's right. Okay. Let's say let's say the pole water pole water is always travel with more than one pole in case one breaks, right? So the pole vaulter has left their extra pole right next to the farmer. So the farmer can look at the extra pole and get the proper length from the exact same pole, right? That's at rest there. Running observer. So the running observer, the barn is contracted, so it's the barn that's contracted. Proper length of the barn was 10 meters, 
the running observer, since the bar is moving with respect to that observer, the bar is 10 meters divided by 1.51, or only 6.6 .6 meters long. So things are even worse. The pole is 15 meters long, and the bar is contracted. The bar is even smaller. Does the runner make it safely through the bar? Is the question. Does the runner make it safely through the bar from both perspectives? <laughs> That's right. So bar is the 10 meter and the pole is 15 meter. That's actually your proper meter, right? Proper length. Right. <laughs> the proper is, is the proper length in the rest frame. Change length to the runner. So to the runner, the length of the pole is always 15 meters long. All right. So this is a, this is a real problem for the runner right now. Because the runner is running towards the bar, not only did the runner was promised the bar would be 10 meters long, but instead the bar is 6.6 .6 meters long. But physically the bar is really the same size as the bar always was. To, to the runner it's 6.6 .6 meters long. Right. From the perspective of the frame of reference. Frame of reference. <laughs> it looks like 6.6 meters, but the actual length is. <laughs> it, it looks like. Looks like uh, now I know what you're asking. Uh -huh. it, the actual length is 6.6 .6 meters long to the runner. Too long. Yes, that is the actual length. So it's full width stuff. So the question is. The runner's running towards the bar. Do we have this situation? Let me close the doors and the runner. I had to do something this morning, so I was just saying, if you look on the internet, you can't find the situation where the runner gets stuck in the bar and, and they close the doors. So, and the pole breaks. So you should put that on the internet. I, I have to. I'd be the first one, probably anybody who did that search, would probably be nobody. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Well, here, here's what we can say. The closing of the two doors is measured to be simultaneous by the ground observer. The key word is simultaneous. To the ground observer, they are indeed simultaneous. They, uh, you know, they push button, signal goes out, both doors close, or Gertrude and and the farmer Arthur do it at the same time. But because the doors are at different positions, they do not close simultaneously as measured by the runner. <coughs> the runner is moving towards the doors, and one event is going to happen at a different time than the other event. In fact, the rear door closes and then opens first, allowing the leading end of the pole to exit. So the runner enters the barn, and that, that back door, the leading Rear door opens and closes, or uh, closes and opens, allows the front part of the pole to go through. Before the front door does not close until the trailing end of the pole passes by. One event occurs before the other event. It's simultaneous, just like that problem we talked about the other day with the, with the train, moving train, and you have two observers. One inside the train and one outside the train, and the events did not happen simultaneously to the observer in the train. To the observer in the train, the first event happened first because they're moving towards that position, and then the second event happened much, much later. They were not simultaneous. This is how relativity resolves this quote-unquote paradox, which is not a paradox. So they're saying this is perfectly okay to say it this way. What do you think so far? You put this together when you were at Ohio State? This, 
these lectures? Yeah. I'm, I'm putting them together over the course of this year. And oh, okay. This morning. Okay. I mean, I'll just I notice stuff all the time. Your, your barn was painted with mail pouch something. Oh, really? So I had Ohio State colors? Well, that's an, that's what they did to northern barns. Southern barns are painted with Sea Rock City. Oh, you know I need to do that. I need to find a barn that says Sea Rock City. <laughs> Thanks for the idea, Michael. Thanks, year. <laughs> Um, Lorentz transformation equation. We can transform from one coordinate system to another. Is, is this in your notes? Yeah, good. Lorentz transformation equation enables us to transform coordinates from a rest frame S to a moving frame S prime. It looks like this. The X coordinate in the moving frame is equal to our famous gamma x minus b times t. All other coordinates are the same because they're not in the moving direction. Time changes. If your time in the moving frame is equal to gamma, times your time in the rest frame minus b over b squared times x. And if you went the other way, you would simply replace your velocity b by negative b and interchange the prime and unprime coordinates. So going to the rest frame from the moving frame, you would have these transformations. I'm just showing you the equations just to be complete. You're actually not going to need these equations for solving those problems and for any problems that we're going to do. But um, they're basically the general results of transforming from one frame to the other. And actually, were developed before special relativity. Most of the time, we like to know the uh, displacement between two events or the time interval between two events. So these transformations simplify to uh, intervals. Displacement in the moving frame is equal to gamma. Displacement in the rest frame minus v times time. And time uh, transforms in this way, gamma delta t minus velocity over c squared times displacement. That's going from the rest frame to the moving frame. And if you go vice versa, from the moving frame to the rest frame. So this is your, your Lorentz transformations from uh, displacements and intervals of time. Again, you won't need to use these for anything that we're doing, but it's just nice to be complete. Relativistic addition of velocities, transforming from a rest frame to a moving frame. We all already know that Galilean relative velocities cannot be applied to objects traveling near the speed of light. You just can't add velocities and end up with a velocity greater than the speed of light. There's a, there's a speed limit there. So uh, for that situation, you have the Lorentz velocity transformation from a rest frame to S. So moving frame S prime looks like this. The value of a velocity in the moving frame, which we call u sub x, we're in the x direction, u sub x prime, I'm sorry, is equal to the value measured in a rest frame minus the relative velocity between the frames, v, over 1 minus that velocity times the relative velocity over c squared. This is transforming from the rest frame to the moving frame. Where u sub x prime is the velocity is seen in the moving s prime frame. So u sub x is the velocity is seen in the rest s frame. And v is the relative velocity between the two frames of reference. If you went the other way, you would simply uh, replace v by negative v in the previous equation, interchange the roles of u sub x and u sub x prime, and you would get this equation. 
going from the moving frame to the rest frame for the addition of velocities. U sub x is the velocity seen in the rest frame. U sub x prime is the velocity seen in the s prime frame. V is the relative velocity between the frames. We actually might need one, either this formula or the other formula for maybe one or two of your problems. Question: Our maximum v between it can only be c, right? Mm -hmm. Even if they're both moving in opposite directions, close That's to the right. speed of light, their delta v will never be greater than the speed of light. That's right. That's a mind blower. Well, our next example is going to show that. Too. Here's how it goes. Two spacecraft, A and B, are moving in opposite directions. An observer on Earth measures the speed of spacecraft A to be 0.75 c, and the speed of spacecraft B to be 0.85 c, but they're moving toward each other. So we're looking at this from Earth. One spacecraft is coming in at 0.75 c like this. Another spacecraft is moving at 0.85 c like this, both near the speed of light. Find the velocity of spacecraft B as measured as observed by spacecraft A. So we're going to go from the rest frame to the moving frame. Spacecraft A is our moving frame. <coughs> so one observer is on Earth at rest. The other observer is in spacecraft A. So the speed V is the relative velocity between the two frames of reference. And that is um, the speed given by spacecraft A, which is 0.75c, designated by this Romulan spacecraft. I think that's the Romulan, right? Mm -hmm. Spacecraft B is the event to be observed. It is moving towards A, and in the Earth frame, it was moving in the negative x direction, so its velocity in the rest frame was a negative 0.85c. And that is the Klingon vessel. We need to transform this event to the moving A frame. Hence, we wish to find what the velocity is for this event as observed by the Romulans. In our situation. So we want to find the velocity in the moving frame of reference, use of X prime. <coughs> well, using our uh, Lorentz transformation, for addition of velocities, we have in the moving frame of reference u sub x prime, that is what's measured in the rest frame, minus the relative velocity between the frames over 1 minus measured in the rest frame relative velocity over c squared. Putting in our values, in the rest frame, the event that we're measuring was negative 0.85c minus the velocity of the other frame of reference, which is 0.75c. 1 minus their product, which will give us 1 plus this. And we'll have a negative 1.6c over 1.63 gives us a speed of negative 0.977c. The negative sign meaning is coming towards you. So if you're the Romulans, you would see the Klingon vessel coming towards you at a speed of magnitude 0.977c. Almost a speed of light. But not greater than the speed of light. That's how it works. Except the Klingon ship would have been cloaked. You would have seen it come towards you. We, you know, we've already established that there can't, can be no practical examples. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, yeah, obviously the Klingon ship would have a cloaking device and uh, they would never be seen. <laughs> there were some episodes, though, when that thing broke down. Right. Here's a quote from 
Einstein. The most important result or general character which the special relativity, special theory has led is concerned with the conception of mass. <coughs> Before the advent of relativity, physics recognized two conservation laws of fundamental importance, namely the conservation of energy and the law of conservation of mass. I understand that these were two separate things. These two fundamental laws appear to be quite independent of each other. You would have mass, you would have energy. By means of the theory of relativity, they have been united into one law. Here's a thought experiment, like a Dankin. Einstein had a lot of these Dankins, thought experiments. It's called Einstein's box. Consider an isolated system, a box. A burst of photons of energy P is emitted from one end of the box, the mass M and length L. So we're at one end, the left end here, where we have a burst of photons traveling get from that end. The radiation carries momentum, E divided by C. Since momentum is conserved, the box will recoil with the speed V given by um, this momentum will be equal to the negative E divided by C. So we'll have the velocity be equal to negative E divided by the mass divided by C. So we have conservation of momentum. Photons go this way, box recoils back this way. After traveling for a time, approximately equal to the length of the box divided by the speed of light, the photons are traveling at the speed of light, the radiation hits the other end of the box and conveys an impulse bringing the box to rest. The box was moving, but now it's going to be hit with an impulse equal to the same change in momentum it just was given and hence it will stop. Thus the result of the process is to move the box through a distance delta x. Delta x is equal to the velocity of the box times delta time, the time it took the photon to travel the length of the box. So that would be equal to negative energy of the photons times L, length of the box over the mass of the box times c squared. So this is an isolated system, and we can't believe that the box's center of mass has moved. In other words, we start with a box, an isolated system, away from everything else in the universe. This burst of photons came out, the box started to move, it hit the other end, the box stopped. But as a result, the net result is the box moved from point A to point B. An isolated system. All of the things considered. So we postulate that the radiation has carried with it the equivalent of a mass M, such that the center of mass has not changed of the whole system. So we'll say that the equivalent mass of this photon times the length it moved, which was L, plus the mass of the box times the length it moved, which was delta X, should equal zero. The center of mass should be in the same spot. Putting the last two equations together, plug it in for delta x, we have uh, negative energy L over m times c squared. M's, L's cancel out on both sides, m's cancel out here. Solve this for the mass, the equivalent mass of that photon, and we get that the mass of the photon is equal to the energy of the photon divided by c squared, or e equals mc squared. So this is how I came up with that equation. It's, it's one way to come up with it. Okay. You can come up with it several ways. This is, this is the easiest way. Okay. But what I think is one of the more brilliant ways to do it. Although this points in the first instance to the mass associated with radiant energy. The implications are wider than this. The energy has mass, energy has momentum.
squared. When the radiation is emitted from one end, the end suffers a decrease of e divided by c squared in mass. Likewise, the absorption of the radiation at the other end means an addition to the mass there. Once the energy is absorbed, it loses its identification as the energy of photons and ultimately becomes just extra thermal energy. In other words, energy in any form has this mass equivalent. General principle of the inertia of energy. Energy has a mass equivalent. Energy has inertia. golf ball in motion has more mass than a golf ball at rest. We'll talk about rest mass in a moment. But the fact that you have more energy, an object in motion means you have more equivalent mass. A heated filament of a lamp has more mass than the same filament in coal. A charged capacitor has more mass than the same capacitor uncharged, and so on. Every extra energy is an equivalent mass associated with that energy. Of course, this was known long before Einstein came around, right as uh, anthropologists have discovered, uh, ancient civilizations already had E equals MC squared. They already knew about that. And this is why the dinosaurs never quite made it. Uh, they're thinking about it, but they came up with E equals MC to the 10th power. It doesn't quite work. And so this is the most famous, one of the most famous equations, so there's a lot of cartoons on this. If you, if you talk this way to plants, they'll grow better. They'll understand you a lot better. They'll feel like they're a person. You know, E equals MC squared. <laughs> you water your plants. <laughs> I'm going to try. Compress energy. A particle has energy by virtue, vir virtue of its mass alone. A stationary particle with zero speed <coughs> and zero kinetic energy has an energy proportional to its inertial mass given by E naught equals mc squared. So you have a mass, a rest mass associated with your inertial mass equal to mc squared. So mass of particle may be completely convertible to energy, and pure energy may be convertible to particle. This would be the amount of energy associated with a mass. So one gram of mass would have a certain amount of energy associated with Uh, mistakes in Einstein. Einstein first came up with E equals MA squared. That didn't quite work, so they came up with E equals MB squared. That didn't quite work either. Finally got with E equals MC squared. Too many of them, I know. <laughs> to account for the conservation of momentum in all inertial frames, the definition of momentum must be modified. Momentum is equal to gamma times m times velocity. Or velocity is the speed of the particle, m is the rest mass, gamma is defined as before, depending on the speed of the particle and its relationship to, to the speed of light. Relativistic energy, when a mass is moving, the total energy of an object depends on its speed, as given by Energy equals relativistic mass, gamma times m times c squared. This would be the mathematical equivalent of saying that something that's moving has more energy and has more mass associated with that energy because it's moving. So the energy of motion, the kinetic energy itself, is the difference of this total energy with the rest mass. Kinetic energy is the total energy minus the 
rest energy of the mass, the inertial mass. So that would be gamma minus 1 mc squared. You'll need to know these two simple formulas for some of the problems in the, in the uh, take-home test. Take the values of energy and momentum. Energy equals gamma mc squared, and momentum is gamma mv. Square them and subtract them. So I get v squared minus momentum squared minus c squared is equal to all this stuff. Gamma squared mc squared squared minus gamma mv squared c squared. With a little bit of algebra, a lot of algebra. We have uh, gamma squared 1 over 1 minus b squared over c squared. Factored out 1 minus b squared over c squared over here. Those cancel out. And we get energy squared equal minus momentum squared times c squared equals mc squared squared. All right, like this. Energy squared equals momentum squared times c squared plus mc squared squared. For particles that have zero mass, such as photons, your rest mass, m, is equal to zero. And you find that for photons, energy just equals momentum times c, equals pc. Total energy and linear momentum for photons, which always travel at the speed but they do have momentum, and they do have inertia. With this idea e equals mc squared, there's a certain amount of energy associated with the subatomic particle, and in particular, um, it's convenient to express that energy in what are called units of electron volts, which are units of energy. Um, they're just the energy that you would give something if you were to accelerate a charged particle through a voltage. You would give it, like if I were to accelerate an electron through 10,000 volts, I would be giving it an energy of 10,000 electron volts. That's what I'd be doing. One electron volt is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joule. That's the charge times the voltage. So the rest energy of an electron, mc squared, is the mass of an electron, 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms, times the speed of light squared, is 8.19 times 10 to the minus 14 joule, or about half a mega electron volt, 0 0.511 mega electron volts. And the rest energy of a proton is the mass of a proton, 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms, times the speed of light squared, 1.5 times 10 to the minus 10 joules, 938 mega electron volts. I'm not sure if we'll use this much, but if you ever go into nuclear physics, we would use this a lot. It's just kind of nice to know in terms of electron volts, if you're accelerating particles, how much the energy of an electron and a proton are. Electron and a positron are produced when, the, when a photon disappears. It's possible to produce two particles from a photon energy. The positron is the antiparticle of the electron. It has the same mass but opposite charge. It is antimatter. So you have a photon near, interacting near a mass particle. You end up with a positron electron pair. Energy, momentum, and charge must be conserved in the process. The minimum energy required would be 
two times the rest mass of an electron would be 1.02 mega electron volt. You could go the other way. You could annihilate two particles, a positron annihilating an electron, produce two photons, the inverse of pair production. So you produce two photons after the annihilation of the electron-positron pair. Antimatter will annihilate matter. It's impossible to create a single photon from this because you must conserve momentum. So if one has to take momentum that way, you must have momentum this way. Assuming our initial momentum in the frame was zero. And one last example, marshmallow. If a marshmallow traveling at 99.99% speed of light hit the Earth, what would happen? Here's the Earth. Here's a marshmallow. This marshmallow is about to collide with the Earth, traveling at 99.99% speed of light. It's a big marshmallow. It is. It's perspective. The Earth is way in the background. The marshmallow is closer to you. If it was traveling like that, it probably... It would be pretty massive. Right? It would be about below the Earth. <laughs> We're about to find out. About to find out. Gamma is 1 over 1 minus velocity squared over C squared square root. At 99.99% of the speed of light, this would be 1 over the square root of 1 minus 0.9999 squared. It is 70.7. If the marshmallow's mass is about 10 grams, so the energy associated with this would be gamma times mass times c squared. It would be 70.7 times 10 grams, 0 0.01, times the speed of light squared. 6.4 times 10 to the 16 joule. A major nuclear explosion is about 10 to the 15 joules. So this would be a few dozen nuclear bombs. It wouldn't destroy the Earth, but it wouldn't be fun wherever it gets. Feel like you have the tools to attack this test. No, it's not your fault. It's just my mother and father. <laughs> <laughs> Just not doing the first two. This, this, the Galilean momentum. Do you feel you got the right answer in those?
have that in, in Galilean relativity, you just you just switch to the velocity of that frame of reference and then calculate. Velocities can add and subtract between frames of reference, but no problem, right? So, uh, but uh, then special relativity is not the case. 